Assalamu alaikum friends. Uh, welcome to uh, Matrix uh, special interview series. Uh, today we're going to talk about Pakistan's challenges abroad as well as uh, this notion of uh, lawfare. So we're going to ask uh, a very prominent uh, international jurist uh, and specialist of international law, Hassan Aslam Shah Saab. Uh, he's uh, based uh, somewhere in the Middle East. He, will, he can tell you himself. But uh, this is his speciality and we thought we should introduce to our common viewers as to what actually is lawfare, how is it affecting Pakistan and what Pakistan needs to do more to escape the negative consequences of the lawfare which he will probably explain being launched by neighboring countries. So thank you very much uh, Hassan Saab. Uh, can you please initially just explain as to what is lawfare? Ji, firstly, thank you very much, uh, Mtasa, for having me here today. Uh, to put it very simply, lawfare is the use of law as a weapon of war. Uh, we're all used to seeing uh, wars being thrust on countries, countries going to armed conflict with one another. But lawfare is using law as a weapon which supplements your military capabilities. So today, for example, countries go to war not only on the physical battlefield, but they also go to war in different international forums where they fight out cases. Uh, we have a recent example in front of us where uh, India and Pakistan fought the Kalbushan Jadav case uh, in which India and Pakistan made two competing set of arguments. So traditionally we are used to seeing India and Pakistan battle out their differences on the battlefield but, but equally they also do these battles on the international forums. Uh, the other example of lawfare is the use of international institutions against a country. So we are as a country in the fat of grey list. Now this is also lawfare because the American uh, influence in the international institutions has been used against Pakistan. Uh, on the one hand, we can say that Pakistan fell short of complying with certain international obligations such as making sure there is an end to uh, financing of terrorism and money laundering in the country. So there were problems. There, of course, there were Which problems. Which outsiders of course, of course, Absolutely. So I'll get to that uh, exploitation part, but I'm just trying to explain how the international system is used against you. So if you're making a mistake, if you have uh, not done your homework, the international instruments will be used against you for arm twisting purposes to make you comply with certain requirements. So lawfare is that weapon which countries used against one another. So how much challenging has it been now for Pakistan and in what form has Pakistan faced the consequences of lawfare? So the biggest ex example of uh, the challenges Pakistan is facing today is the fact that Pakistan has been unable to get out of the fat of grey list. Uh, I believe that initially Pakistan was slow in understanding the gravity of the situation, uh, understanding what needed to be done. And by the time Pakistan took it seriously, which was in about the one, last one and a half years, it was already too late. And now it has become a completely political uh, equation between the US and Pakistan, whereby Pakistan is now literally pleading that take us out of the grey list. But, the, but every time we get a new set of requirements, a new set of... Uh, uh, norms, a new set of excuses. So if we had done the homework earlier, if we had moved forward fast earlier, we would not be in the situation that we are today. Mm -hmm. So Pakistan, basically the authorities here never took uh, the challenges that were upon their head seriously, uh, like when they started emerging 12, 13 years ago? Well, so unfortunately, our, uh, it has become a national habit of ours to, to react and to be reactive in nature, we have not been proactive. Uh, the world has been changing at a very rapid pace around us. Uh, we take perhaps pride in, uh, in putting out fires on a daily basis. The only problem is that the fires continue to emerge and once you've set, put out one set of fires, then you have another set of fires emerging. So if we had acted earlier, if we had understood the legal requirements earlier, uh, if we had not left our planning to the future, then we would not be in many situations that we are in today. So what is, uh, what do you think, is this also responsible for why Pakistan's narrative doesn't sell abroad? So, look, when it comes to narrative, uh, the way I see it, uh, when it comes to a narrative, you must have a story to tell. And uh, before you tell a story, you must understand the meaning of things, how things occur around you, 
what are the different themes that are working against you as well as the themes that you are floating globally. So I'll give you a very small example. Uh, Pakistan, I believe, was making some progress towards building its story and building its own narrative. But then, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had this Salcourt lynching incident. So suddenly the cameras turned towards Pakistan. Uh, we got uh, picked up by the international media for the wrong reasons that was flashed throughout the world. Of course, our adversaries uh, were, um, you know, chuckling with glee when they saw us make this blunder or this when it happened in our backyard. So these are things that literally destroy whatever good you have done over the last few years. So unless we are able to stop these incidents from happening on a repeated basis, we are not going to be able to build a story. Uh, fortunately for Pakistan, the ground was being paved for Pakistan to build its story because of whatever India has done in the last two, two or three years. So I'm telling you from Middle Eastern perspective, India's goodwill, India's uh, image that they had cultivated over the years had been gravely affected. It had been negatively affected because of what we see happening in India, uh, you know, in the form of the attacks on minorities. But frankly, if you ask me, I don't think we did enough to leverage on their follies. What happened, what was happening in India was a godsend opportunity and a blessing in disguise for Pakistan? Yes, it was. And uh, and look, I mean, if India is bad, that does not automatically elevate Pakistan in the global stature. India and Pakistan are seen by the world as two standalone entities who are always at daggers drawn and at one another. But India's loss does not automatically transform into Pakistan's gain. We ought to have done a lot more, which we unfortunately did not do. And this is something that I have been trying to sensitize uh, people in Pakistan who matter that, look, you have to do certain things to project yourself globally. And one of them, of course, is to stop incidents such as the Salcourt incident from happening because these small incidents, in fact, I'm not saying it's small in the sense that it was not consequential. It was a very horrific and a very sad incident. But, but isolated incidents like these, which may not be a state pattern, they still end up negating whatever goodwill you have generated over the years. So this is one of the problems that I see. Uh, and the second problem we have, uh, Imtiasa, is that we do not have a global voice. We don't have an international media presence globally, which can tell our story to the world. We sadly are on the back foot and every time something comes against us, we are only responding through articles and we are responding through some, uh, uh, shall I say, you know, statements which don't really carry much weight. Now, this is not how you counter the, the hybrid lawfare or the narrative or the, or the challenges that are thrown on you globally. So what's the reason for that? I think it's I think it's because we as a nation have not been able to understand our purpose. We have not been able to understand the fact that uh, uh, the Kaid, when he mentioned uh, unity, faith and discipline, he did not just mean it in a rhetorical sense. He actually meant it as the, the, the foundational principle on the basis of which we must forge ahead as a nation. Uh, partly because of the the, the uh, existential threat that we face from India and partly because we were not able to institutionalize uh, ourselves as much as we should have, we were not able to move in a, in a straight line. We have been going all over the place and none of our institutions is, is above individuals who are governing them on a given day. So whatever we have is the result of individual mandates, people who are telling us what needs to be done. We, we see around us and this uh, basically is across all political parties, we have individuals whom we follow because we don't see that institutional strength uh, that can unite us. So unfortunately, the fact that we have not been able to build on our institutions is the reason why we are not able to tell our story. But is it the only reason and how much of it has to got to do with geopolitics? Look, Geopolitics is a constant. It's always going to change. In today's world, uh, the challenges are going to be increasing by the day as we see around us. So we can't stop America from causing it, with in, you know, causing further with India. We can't stop the global alliances around us that are taking place at a rapid pace. But what we can do is we can we can strengthen ourselves from within and we can have a bold face in front of the world. And when I say bold face, I don't just mean it from a force posture perspective. I mean from an intellectual perspective. If we have good governance in Pakistan, if we have functioning institutions, if we have 
uh, uh, you know, a tech boom, which to some extent we see happening in Pakistan now. If we are moving towards the 21st century in terms of our intellectual growth, then we would be able to we would be able to face these challenges in a far more better way and then the world would be gravitated towards us as opposed to us running after countries to 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 prove our alliances to prove our friendships i always give the example of the iraqi uh, attack on kuwait that happened in the first gulf war uh, kuwait is a small country uh, when it was attacked by iraq the, the world came to its rescue. It did not need a huge army to defend itself. The world came to fight for us, for, for it. So if we are strong from within, if we have institutions, if we have a robust economy, if the world sees us as a potential venue of investment, uh, of collaboration, then of course we don't, our job is automatically done. This is uh, so true. Uh, I think you are, you are hitting the right chords. And friends, you just uh, heard Hassan Aslam Shah Saab. The bottom line is we have to set our house in order. We have to strengthen ourselves intellectually as well as in communications because communication, we are very bad. And that Pakistani officials, the government, shall have to come out of this reactionary mode. We have all our life been reacting to situations instead of preempting and preparing ourselves, positioning ourselves for potential challenges that are headed towards us. Hope you liked it and uh, welcome any feedback you, have, you may have on, on Matrix Media. Thank you very much.